Welcome back and thank you for joining us for episode 76 of Two Steps Forward. We are up to Acts chapter 10 and we are, uh, we've been introduced to like, essentially the two main players of the, human players at least, of the book of Acts, which are Peter and the Apostle Paul. Uh, a lot of the action of the first third of Acts revolves around Peter and for the second two-thirds really is the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. But we're kind of coming to a conclusion of Peter's work here uh, in the book of Acts with Acts chapter 10 and the culmination of Peter going to the home of a Gentile named Cornelius, a Roman centurion. And it, Peter's still growing. Uh, Jesus has already died, resurrected, ascended into heaven. The Spirit has been sent. And yet Peter is not a finished product. Uh, as a Christian, he still is blown away by the fact that uh, the gospel can go to mm. Gentiles mm -hmm. and that God has made Gentiles equally accessible to him as Jews are. Okay, so read through your personal uh, Bible copy of Acts chapter 10 at home. Here is my paraphrase for Acts 10. In Caesarea, the town of Caesarea, lived a Roman centurion named Cornelius. He was part of something called the Italian Regiment. He was a God-fearer, which meant a Gentile who believed in the God of the Jews, and he was very generous with those who were in need. At 3 p.m. one day, he had a vision, and the angel of God said to him, Cornelius, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Send for Peter, who is staying at the home of Simon the Tanner. So Cornelius sent two servants and one of the soldiers to Joppa to go get Peter. At noon the next day, Peter was on the roof of his home praying, and he became hungry. While he was waiting on the food, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven open and a large sheet with four corners being lowered. The sheet contained loads of what are called unclean animals, uh, things like reptiles, certain birds of various kinds, certain four-footed creatures that were unclean. And a voice told him, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter, who's in the trance at this time, says, Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice replied back, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times in a row, and then the sheet was pulled back up into heaven. And Peter was contemplating what the vision might mean when Cornelius' servants showed up at his door asking for him. And the Spirit told Peter to go with them. The servants explained how Cornelius had sent them, and Peter invited the men into his house as guests. The next day, Peter arrived at Cornelius' house down in Caesarea. And Cornelius had invited friends and relatives over. And when Peter showed up, he bowed down. And Peter told him, uh, Cornelius, excuse me, told him, to, Cornelius bowed down. Peter told him to stand up, saying that he wasn't anything but a man himself. Peter explained how it was against Jewish law for a Jew to enter into the home of a Gentile, but God had informed him through a vision that nothing God created is unclean. Peter then asked why Cornelius sent for him. Cornelius shared that several days prior to that, he had been praying at 3 p.m. in the afternoon in his home when a man, like an angel, stood before him and told him to send for Peter. Cornelius said that they were all there to listen to anything that Peter was there to teach them. Peter at this point says, okay, now I know. Experientially, now I know that God is the God of all people. Peter reminded Cornelius of the good news that had come through Jesus of Nazareth, the promised Messiah. God sent this Jesus into the world, and after being baptized by John, he healed many and did good because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He was crucified but rose, and Peter says he and the disciples were all witnesses of this. In other words, he recounts for him the basic gospel narrative. Uh, he says that this Jesus will come back to judge the world, but all who trust in him will have their sins forgiven. And at this time, the Holy Spirit came upon all who were present. And the Jews with Peter were amazed that the Holy Spirit was upon the Gentiles as well. Uh, they were speaking in tongues and praising God. And Peter said they should be baptized since they have now received the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles were baptized and Peter stayed with them for a few days. That's the summary. Mm -hmm. Initial yeah. reactions. No, um, I mean, it seems a little weird, like, the specific, like, way he had this vision, or three times, or whatever, but, I mean, I understand the point of it. It's hard for us, as 21st century inclusive Americans, to think of, of a God who in any way would be exclusive towards uh, different ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. 
But just understand, for the Jews who have been conditioned to understand themselves as God's people and separate from the rest of the world for, uh, you know, essentially a couple millennia at this point, mm -hmm. um, that was such a radical foreign thought. God had been saying under the Old Covenant to stay away from those people, to not eat those kinds of meats, to not go into the homes of foreigners. And now that he is actually sending Peter into this, it's 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 it turns up turn overturns everything though about the way Peter thought about the world. Well, I always thought it was a little weird that God had like his own people. Like yeah. I've come first to the Jews. But I guess when you think about it every they all started as Jews, right? Who's they? The human race. Like mm -hmm. everyone was a Jew. There were two, only two people. Well, so they all started in the Middle East. Uh, and there were only two people. But there, yeah. So the Jews, the Jews technically trace back to Abraham. So uh -huh. prior to Abraham, you wouldn't necessarily say the people were Jews, even though they they shared a common ancestry. Y yeah. Uh huh. So, but your point your point of Jewish DNA goes all the way back to a a Adam is true. Yeah, but I mean, I've always thought it weird that God did have like chosen people, or uh, that seems strange. I guess even even today though, it's not. Like, we balance this idea between if somebody says, okay, are all humans God's children mm -hmm. or are believers God's children? That's a, that's a more difficult question to answer than first thought. It's not a yes or no answer. So I think in my head, when I hear, like, Jews and Gentiles, I think I always equate that with, like, believer and non-believer. Yeah. You know, like, there's two races of humans, believer or non-believer. Yeah. Well, that's why Cornelius is so unique, because he's busting into a third category. He is a God-fearing Gentile. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about this. That term, God-fearer, mm -hmm. is a technical term that's used in the New Testament to describe Gentiles, Greeks, who have uh, essentially repented of their pagan gods mm -hmm. and turned to the God of Israel as the one true God. Uh -huh. And Cornelius falls into that category. And even that for Jews, they didn't quite know what to think of these people. Mm -hmm. That's why there's a lot of tension in the early Christian church amongst the Jews who converted to Christianity and the Gentiles who converted to Christianity and what cultural practices the Gentiles should be absorbing because that was such part and parcel of the faith life of the Jews. So he wasn't actually a Christian, though, at that point. No, he's... he's a believer in the sense that he knows the God of Israel as the one true God. Yeah. But because of, we can infer by Peter's teaching to him here, mm -hmm. he doesn't yet know of Jesus Christ as... Yeah. So I'm assuming he would have gone through then like adult circumcision and all the things they had to do when they converted. Um, the It's a good question. I, I think the, no, the because he's a God-fearing Gentile, otherwise he would have been referred to as a practicing Jew. Okay. Uh, a Jewish proselyte mm -hmm. uh, is somebody who converted, and then they had to be essentially baptized in the Jewish faith and mm -hmm. circumcised. Mm -hmm. But a God-fearing Gentile is somebody who didn't absorb all the Jewish ceremonial, didn't live as a Jew culturally, gotcha. but nonetheless worshipped the Jewish God, which was hard to do when you're not absorbing the Jewish culture. Yeah. It was, which is, again, Jews didn't really know exactly what to think of them. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a kind of a tense moment, and you can tell it in the way that Peter interacts with him. You can tell it in the way that Peter gets this vision, mm -hmm. where he's he's re like, go figure, Peter. When he's when Jesus is alive, sometimes Peter's rebuking Jesus. When mm -hmm. when God is coming to him in a trance, sometimes Peter is rebuking God. Like, mm -hmm. no, God, I will never do such a thing. And it's just it's totally consistent with Peter's personality mm -hmm. type. But you can see the tension involved here for him, and that's why it's it's that much more convincing when Peter goes back to the rest of the church. Mm -hmm. and says, I have seen with my own eyes that the Spirit works in the home of the Gentiles. The, Jew, the Jewish leaders, the early church leaders, excuse mm -hmm. me, are convinced by that because Peter has such authority and such credibility. Yeah. So uh, here's the three daily devotional thoughts. Number one, uh, God-fearing qualities. I mentioned that term God-fearer as a technical term to describe Jews who, uh, excuse me, Gentiles, who converted to, without absorbing the Jewish culture, converted to believing in the, the God of the Jews as the one true God. Notice the way that he's described there. He's described, he's characterized as being devout and generous to those in need, and he prayed regularly. Now, that's not an exhaustive list of what it means to fear God, mm -hmm. but it's a pretty good list. To be, one, committed to God or devoted. Number two, charitable, generous and charitable to those in need, and three, to pray regularly. 
That's a pretty good list. If you said somebody, what does it mean to be a Christian? Mm -hmm. um, the, in, in fact, I would put it even, you can put it the opposite way. If somebody calls themselves a Christian and yet they don't possess any characteristics of being undividedly devoted to God, charitable to those who are in need, mm -hmm. and regular prayers, I don't know, like, regardless of what they call themselves or what they say they believe, I don't know if they're a Christian. Yeah. And those are three traits that I think, okay, what does it mean to fear God? Mm -hmm. the, the ones that are attributed to Cornelius, those three, I think, are good traits. Is there anything, that, any traits mm -hmm. that you might theoretically add to that? I couldn't really come up with. No, so I always think of, like, um, church attendance, which, I mean, some yeah. people might think that's ar arbitrary. Yeah. But if you are regularly in church, I think that shows like this is a God is a priority in my life. I make right. time every week, which is like the in my opinion, like the bare minimum. You right. Know? So that's yes. The I mean, we've talked about vital signs, and yeah. I've I've said that within a context of a church because I can't look into anybody's hearts. And God doesn't ask me to. Mm -hmm. The vital signs I look to for spiritual activity would be uh, worship life, study life. Mm -hmm. um, giving life mm -hmm. and uh, volunteering, like yeah. serving one another, mm -hmm. which which is impossible to do without being in the body. And those, so those are the four things that I tend to look for. Um, but these these things here are too, and I think that what you mentioned, worship falls into that category of the, commitment. The first one, yeah. Yeah, like my schedule sort of revolves, it's inconvenient, but my schedule revolves around being with God and God's people and worship. Yeah. The interesting one is prayer because I think I've talked before, like, um, it's something that I definitely struggle with. And I was just telling you today, like I'm reading this book about prayer and the man talks about how, um, he calls them breath prayers that he like, th uh, throughout the day prays prayers like Lord help me, or I need you, or just like, um, Jesus. He just says, Jesus. and he said, sometimes he doesn't even like cognitively think he's praying them, but like the Holy Spirit is praying, um, for him, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and also he was saying that, um, if, so the reason he's praying these prayers is because he just uh, gets like overwhelmed throughout the day and the natural tendency is just to try and figure everything out on your own mm -hmm. and go in that direction. But if you actually, he, I think he, the term he used was um, poor in spirit, maybe he said yeah. he becomes poor in spirit, like overwhelmed and he's, yeah. and he describes his spirit as a dry and weary land. And then that leads to like consistent prayer. So when you hear like, oh, so Peter's going up on his roof and praying, it just makes it seem like, oh, that sounds like so much work. I have to go somewhere, like set aside time to be like by myself and quiet, which some of that is good or maybe necessary at times. But I do like the idea of just like praying throughout your day, yeah. which I think Paul maybe talks more about. Well... Any, we've talked about this before, the heroes of faith, any, what is a consistent trait amongst them is they talk to God regularly in prayer. And I, I remember a report I read once that said something like some piece of research that said the average American pastor, not the average American Christian, the average mm -hmm. American pastor prays something like an average of eight uh, to 12 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And just remember thinking... That seems, honestly though, doesn't that seem like pretty good no that does not seem good to me that my dinner prayers i feel like like i know Lu luther prayed but three to four hours a day I, I'm, or not whatever, saying, but... I'm not saying i'm good at this i'm saying i'm i'm a i'm better as a person i'm more in touch yeah if you want to put it like that with god mm -hmm. i'm more a better sense of balance of self and mm -hmm. work and family when i pray regularly and yet when things get panicky my first instinct my flesh just wants to problem solve. Okay, I would be very curious to know how many people pray more than 12 minutes a day. If you're mm -hmm. praying 12 minutes every day, yeah, like I feel like that's definitely something. That's definitely more than some weeks I'm doing, 12, yeah. more than 12 minutes a day. I don't think that's... Well... I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a goal to do more. And I think if you, like I was saying, if you take your view of prayer as being like this lengthy time I have to set aside and go by myself and and maybe convert the thought into like praying continuously throughout the day or talking to God at various points in your day. I think that then that changes. <clears throat> that removes some of the 
um, like obstacles to prayer, I guess. The So th the balance on it is Jesus does say, don't be like the Pharisees who think because of their many words, they will be heard before God. And mm -hmm. essentially they're doing law and prayers for show. That's not an excuse to not have a rich, robust prayer life. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's interesting to me that in the book of Daniel, and Daniel is one of the guys that is the most, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's a sinner saved by grace. He's one of the more impressive characters in the entire Old Testament. You know, um, he's in a foreign land. He does the right thing the vast majority of the time in mm -hmm. difficult circumstances. We're also told that in Daniel, he three times a day, he goes and prays facing Jerusalem for an mm -hmm. hour each time, morning, afternoon, and evening. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I would ask is, why does the Spirit go out of his way to tell us that Daniel prays three times a day for an hour each time? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know this for sure, but what we're also seeing is Daniel does things that I don't know I would be strong enough to do. How does Daniel get so strong? Well, mm -hmm. the fact that he's praying three times a day at the length that he is, yeah. is probably making him strong. And so I, I just think that's not, again, not that that is like, oh yeah, to be a Christian, you have to pray X number of minutes or mm -hmm. hours a day. No, that's not the point. Uh, the point is, to um, how do I glorify God in my life because he glorified me by grace and what does the spirit then move me to do? And I, it, very clearly it's devoting yourself to fervent prayer. Mm -hmm. how, how much that looks, I don't know, but if it doesn't exist in your life on a daily basis, mm -hmm. I think that's that's not cutting it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, All right, so Cornelius, Peter's surprise. Cornelius is this God-fearing, devoted to God, God-pleasing. Number two, Christian freedom. Uh, when God gives Peter the vision to uh, of the food that is brought to him, Peter's response is, surely not, Lord. Send, he's sending it back. Uh, it's, it's unclean. He warns God. He's telling God, it's unclean. Uh, take your unclean food back. Maybe he thought it was like a test. Maybe. Maybe. Um, I, sh I should give him more benefit of the doubt, but his track record is such of like, oh, man, I know better than what God thinks, so... I'll, I'll tell God what to feel about this. And God says, Peter, what are you doing? Stop calling things unclean that I myself have made. And interestingly enough, God has to do this how many times? Three. Because Peter doesn't get things the first time. He doesn't get things the second mm -hmm. time. He doesn't get things the third time. So why do we need to learn the same lessons and go through the same hardships sometimes multiple times? Mm -hmm. Because we are stubborn creatures who wants to prove God wrong much of the time instead of just surrendering and bowing before God. And Peter represents, I think, the instincts of religious humans who are constantly trying to sanctify certain neutral things, certain foods, certain clothes, certain dress, certain words, certain haircuts, certain music, uh, as more holy than other things. And we've talked about that self-righteous instinct before, but very clearly, uh, according to the gospel, none of those things is inherently neutral things are not inherently mm -hmm. clean or unclean. But somebody who is elevating something that is neutral to be more godly and disparage others as acting, living less godly, that person needs to repent. Calling people to repentance over their preferences of neutral things means you have to repent because you've underestimated the goodness of God and the freedom that God has given to us. Yeah, I see you got haircuts in there. I did get haircuts. People, okay, so people don't entirely know this. I don't even know if I've totally explained this to you. Why? To me? So, about my hair. Uh-huh. I know we've talked about it, but I don't know if I mentioned to you a comment that I heard somebody say. Mm -hmm. I overheard another Christian man within the earshot of a, another young man who had longer hair. Um, and he didn't under, he didn't know that this younger man was listening. Mm -hmm. And this older Christian man made a comment about, uh, I won't repeat it, but it was just like, in, it, it's inappropriate. It was an inappropriate joke or inappropriate. About long hair? About men, men with, men long with hair. longer hair. <clears throat> and um, I, at the time, I didn't get into it. I didn't want to fight about it. I didn't, mm -hmm. whatever. And in my mind, I said, nope, I'm going to prove him wrong. Because mm -hmm. I knew that older man perceived me as mm -hmm. his spiritual leader. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I thought, okay, well, if I do this behavior mm -hmm. that he just made fun of, yeah. then he's going to see, okay, it, it's possible to be have some level of spiritual maturity and engage in this behavior. Uh -huh. And I thought it would also then kind of affirm the younger man who was not doing anything wrong, but heard this older Christian man, mm -hmm. whatever. And so I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not, but um, it was my way of, it's been part of my way of trying to, I constantly have feel like I have this personal mission of rooting out um, 
self-righteousness in the church. Well, your hair's always been weird. <laughs> Not, like, weird, but it's <laughs> always been, it's like... it's only my hair. It's either, like, a hard part or high and tighter. You know what I mean? It always goes with whatever. People have always been talking about your hair. Like, this is not surprising. This long hair or anything. To too many. Else. The other... Offensive to all and surprising to none. <laughs> the other thing I think is really interesting, it's, it's only been recently that men have even had short hair. In world history. Yes, yeah. men always have long hair. Like, why yes. is that strange? There was not a supercuts on every corner <laughs> in the ancient world where guys, every three to four weeks, that is a modern business thing that guys have, in the t late 20th uh, century said, oh, yes, to be an actual appropriate, respectable male, you have to get your hair cut a certain way every, that is a man-made business rule. So the those, gospel does not submit the man-made business rules. But my guess is those men with, those older men with those nice haircuts are wearing short sleeve dress shirts. Ugh. <laughs> I know you have a thing with short, short sleeve dress shirts, too. I'm just saying, if you're yeah. going to say this is professional. That's, uh, every, C.S. Lewis said, everything that is not eternal is eternally out of date. And therefore, things that can expire from a trend standpoint, you mm -hmm. shouldn't concern yourself with too much. And that's stylistic things, language things, word things, music things. Everything that is not eternal is eternally out of date. Yes. So mm -hmm. only if bank on the things of God, which are his word is eternal. Mm -hmm. If something is not directly and explicitly said in his word, then don't, don't tell people this is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Devotional thought number three, no favoritism. Uh, in verse 34, Peter says, now I realize that God doesn't, surely doesn't show favoritism. And don't you think that Peter intellectually understood that God was pretty fair and doesn't show favoritism before? I think he did. Uh, but I think what he's saying is experientially now. There's a difference between, uh, even the, the Bible's words for no, there's a word oida, which essentially means intellectual knowledge, and there's a word ginosko, which means experiential knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so th those two are very different things. To know about God's grace and to know, ex know personally God's grace. To know uh, the details about Jesus Christ and to personally know Jesus by his spirit. Those are very different understandings. And so Peter's saying, I experientially now know that God doesn't show favoritism to anybody because I, I've worshipped with Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And it was glorifying God and the Spirit came down upon this. And in some respect, you know, I think, um, you know, the, the Christian faith is unique in its lack of favoritism to others. Because my, my explanation of this would be, if you look at other world religions, whether they have an eightfold path of enlightenment or five pillars or four goals or even just ten commandments, and you have to keep these things perfectly uh, or, or better than others in order to attain salvation. What's interesting is some people are more conditioned from personality standpoint, from physical gift standpoint, or from cultural standpoint mm -hmm. to carry out those things. So, for instance, um, I don't know how, for example, a mentally handicapped person... Mm -hmm. can follow an eightfold path of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're capable of doing that. And therefore, I think it gives a disadvantage to those who are maybe mentally disadvantaged. That I, I think the is Islamic faith, uh, or excuse me, the, the Buddhist faith, oh. uh, or the Islamic faith, gives disadvantages to those who might not have such things. In fact, I even think that... Um, what, I don't want to get into it too much, but the teaching of baptism, when you think, uh, when you say that I have to be a believer who claims my own baptism and I have to make my decision for Jesus Christ, yeah. I think that gives an unfair advantage to people who mm -hmm. are more intellectually competent than others. What if you have a mentally challenged person? What if you have a little child mm -hmm. that can't make their claim for Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, whereas I think when you can say baptism is for all, that it shows that the gospel is equally inviting to all. It's not about what we do. It's not about what we choose. It's not about what we think. It's about what God has done for us. Mm -hmm. And I think baptism, including child baptism, clearly shows that. And so, you know, I think sometimes the charge of Christianity as being exclusive um, you know, that proximity helps. Like if you're born and raised in a Christian fa family, you have an unfair advantage over those who are born in different parts of the world. I understand that concern. I understand that complaint. But I also know what Christianity teaches is Jesus died for the sins, not of some, but of all. That God is not far from any one of us if we would just reach out to him, is mm -hmm. what the Apostle Paul says in his sermon in Athens, in Acts 17. 
And that I know God goes out of his way to tell his leaders, like Peter, that he doesn't show favoritism. So far as I can tell, every other worldview and religion shows some amount of favoritism. Mm -hmm. Christianity, I think, is the one I can make the best argument for that does not show favoritism, which is consistent with what grace means. Mm Mm-hmm. Any final thoughts on Acts chapter 10? Anything we didn't cover with Peter and Cornelius? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> okay. Uh, should we close the prayer then? Mm-hmm. Uh, shall I close the prayer? Sure. Okay. Father, uh, we thank you for the story of Peter and Cornelius. Peter had a lot to learn, even as like a leader in the church, either, even as a guy who had witnessed death, resurrection, ascension, and the experience of the special outpouring of the Spirit, Peter still had a ton to learn. He struggled with racism, ethnic superiority, and viewing himself as somehow inherently better than others like the Gentiles. Lord, if we don't admit that we have some of those same self-righteous struggles um, personally, um, we're... We're, we're missing uh, a big part of potential sin in our lives. Help us to be humble. Help us to recognize you're a God who loves all and shows no favoritism and uh, to actually embrace that concept that we're all in the same boat, that we would treat one another, our fellow humans and our fellow believers as equals. And uh, that's because you have treated us all so graciously. And let the way that we treat others like this and accept others uh, be an insp- inspiration to all, both believer and non-believer. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for studying with us. We will see you tomorrow for episode 77 as we take a look at Acts chapter 11.